Me on? Good? Okay. What's up guys, it's Jerry, and I am here once again to talk to you about a film that's right. Home Slices, Hot Skillets, Skrillex, Pan thing, alright. So uh, this past weekend, um, I was treated to a screening of a new film, a new horror film, because that's right ladies and gentlemen, Halloween is coming. We're reaching the end of the summer. We are gearing down from the heat, you know, the slip and slides and the water parks and we're getting ready for haunts and we're getting ready for spooky decorations and whatnot. You know, they release horror movies all year long, but I think we're getting into the point in time now where people are actually starting to think about, oh, Halloween's coming, you know. So I'll stop beating around the bush now. We saw, um, as above, so below. That's right. The new found footage horror movie that takes place in the catacombs beneath Paris. Um, and this movie <laughs> is interesting. Um, it's written and directed by the Dowdle brothers, uh, John Eric Dowdle and Drew Dowdle, I believe their name is. Uh, and you might know their name from such films as The Poughkeepsie Tapes, uh, and Quarantine, and a film that I quite liked uh, called Devil, that a lot of people shit on because of M. Night Shyamalan having produced it. Um, most people don't realize that he produced it and didn't write and direct it. Um, it was written by the hard candy guy. But that movie I, I really liked and um, you know, it sort of plays out like a, like a long Twilight Zone episode. And I've heard it said that these guys improve with every film, so how does this theory hold up now that they've got, you know, another one? Um, and uh, mm, I don't know how that theory holds up. Um, because As Above, So Below is a really uneven experience in one, like, very specific way. As Above, So Below centers around, uh, I guess you would call them archaeologists led by, um, this girl called Scarlet, who's, you know, really, she's really pretty and very charming and whatnot, but she's also kind of a sociopath. Um, <laughs> And she's always getting into places she ain't supposed to be, looking for the uh, fabled Philosopher's Stone that Nicholas Flamel supposedly created many, many years ago. Um, which, for the first part of this movie, when they're talking about that so much, you're going to be thinking of Harry Potter if you know Harry Potter at all. Because they're running around various parts of Europe being like, Ah, oh, Nicholas Flamel! The Sorcerer's Stone! The Philosopher's Stone! We have to find it! So, um, that's a thing. But, um, you've got her, and then she sort of assembles her, her team or whatever. She gets a cameraman. Um, she goes to get her friend, played by, oh, I think his name is Ben Feldman, the actor, um, to, to come along with her. And, um, she thinks, you know, that she's getting closer to figuring out where the Sorcerer's Stone is, and she wants to find it. And, uh, so that's sort of the mission they're embarking on. And, uh... The thing about this movie is this, the scary parts, the parts that matter, I guess you would say, the most, are good, like, are, are actually well constructed, they're actually very stressful, they're actually kind of jarring. Um, there's a scene in which, you know, they're crawling through this chute in a cave and it's collapsing, and it's, it's, it's really sort of a lesson in simplicity, because it's just one shot, but it's really stressful and effective, it was, it was really cringeworthy, you know, and, um, the other parts of this movie, the exposition stuff and the, and the stuff where we're getting to know the characters is really weird and stiff, um, because the thing about found footage movies in general is that, you know, the conceit is we're supposed to believe these are real people going through a real situation, and that's part of what makes them so scary, aside from the restrictive, uh, first-person point of view. And the, for the first 25 minutes, you know, the first act of this movie, 
it really doesn't solve any of the problems that, that keep you from sinking yourself into a found footage movie. I mean, the, the dialogue is really, really basic, really expositional stuff to the point where, you know, bad things are happening and, and supporting characters will be like, this is bad for you, like literally. And uh, that kind of takes away from your ability to immerse yourself in this. Um, and the film also, throughout a lot of it, doesn't take any particular strides to solve the whole, like, why are you filming syndrome that so many found footage movies suffer from. There are a lot of times when they're filming uh, where you got to wonder, like, why would the cameraman be sitting across the room but still filming this? Or, you know, why would somebody pick up a camera and point it at their face in a very stressful situation? Um, you can just feel the movie. You know, you never get lost in it. And the movie never allows you to forget that it's a movie, or at least it didn't really for me, until those stressful moments come out. Um, and, you know, you'll have these characters, too, where they'll say things... Like, 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 the Ben Feldman character, the whole time, is like, Oh, no, I'm not coming with you. I'm not going in there. You know, you could go, you're crazy. You know, you got me locked up in a Turkish prison for, for a week. You know, I'm not doing anything with you. But he doesn't ever, ever actually physically protest. Like, there's a whole scene where they're going to the catacombs, and he's like, I'm not going down there. As he's walking down there. And then again, he's like, I'm not going down there. As he's getting further down there. And then he's like standing next to this hole inside of a cave. And he's like, I'm not going down there. And then something bad happens. And he immediately jumps to the cave. So you can just feel there's a real disparity between the script and the film itself. Because the script sort of instructs characters. It has characters say things because they have to, because I guess that's what sensible people would say, but the actions are the opposite. Like, like it feels like they, they feel the need to placate us by going like, oh yeah, he's totally reluctant, even though the action never supports that idea. So there's this really weird thing where the script never allows you to forget that it's there because it's so sort of thin and basic. But, um, you know, like I said, when they get down into the cave and shit starts to hit the fan, that stuff's genuinely spooky. You know, that stuff's genuinely stressful and scary. There's some creative stuff going on. There's a lot of really jarring imagery and things down there. They don't necessarily explain a lot of stuff, but there are things in that part of the movie where you're like, ooh, like that's just jarring to look at or, or, or you know, nothing should, you know, be that way or sound like that. Some of the things they see in this little journey into their own personal hell. And, and, and those are genuinely spooky. So the stuff they find in the catacombs and those situations, that's when the movie's at its best, that's when the actors are at their best, that's when everything is at its best. It's like these guys, these, these two directors, they seem competent, they seem like they're able to construct a good scare. The trouble is they need to work on their writing because again, a lot of this stuff, especially in the beginning, feels like a first draft and, and it doesn't, play out in a way that feels realistic and characters don't talk realistically enough when it counts to make us believe the found footage element so much. And this called attention to itself so much, inadvertently of course, but still it was just like, oh, I don't believe any of this, really. I don't know why anybody would, would go along with this craziness, <laughs> but um, you know, for a fun time on a Friday night, you know, you want to get together with your buddies, you want to have a couple scares, it's effective for that. I mean, the catacombs, they, they do lend themselves to this, they certainly look creepy and, and they seem like a good setting for a horror movie, so whoever had the idea of, of setting a horror movie there, you know, was clearly on the right track. And the way they play with sounds in this movie, especially, you know, in the in the creepier bits, is, is actually pretty cool and jarring, so I gotta give them credit for that as well. I also really like that they got some French actors for this, you know, just to... And I sort of like the way um, these guys tend to end these movies, at least for, for this one and the last one. Um, you know, they, they sort of end up just slightly in a place you wouldn't have expected for this kind of movie, so that's cool. This movie does leave a lot to be desired. It could have been a lot better. But the scary parts are scary and, and creative, so I guess that's what matters. So it's an alright movie for that sort of stuff, and I did leave satisfied. And you know, I always hate saying this, but, you know, it's like, 
the rest of the movie, when it's not being scary, I think you'll at least be entertained because it's kind of goofy. Um, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm okay on this movie. I mean, these guys, they may be improving. I feel like they need to take some writing lessons because they did, I thought they did a really good job when they had somebody else's script, which they did for Devil. With the hard, the guy who wrote Hard Candy wrote Devil, and that movie, I think, is a lot better than this one. But this one isn't without its charms. So, um, yeah, what's, uh, what are you looking forward to this holiday season now that, that Halloween is on its way? Um, are there any horror movies that you are particularly excited for? Let's talk about that. Uh, anyhow, until next time, as above, so below is the movie. I am Jerry. Cheers.